Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are sitting far away from us. Uh, we are contagious. There are viruses, bacteria. Garlic bread. At moment. Garlic, garlic breath, definitely. You're smart. That's a good distance. Thank you. Usually people want you to come closer, but we don't. It's okay. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Jonathan Parfrey. I'm the director of a small nonprofit here in Los Angeles called Climate Resolve. There's only about 12 of us. Um, and usually we focus in on climate resilience and adaptation. And uh, every once in a while, uh, we get into the business of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have a very robust program on transportation sector. Um, we care a lot about GHG and reducing it because we care about people. We think that, you know, we reduce our, our emissions will help us reduce our impacts. And uh, that's an area that I think is very, very important. Um, so we're here to talk about accelerating action and getting beyond the traditional carbon crediting. And if you don't want to talk about new forms of carbon crediting, there are other wonderful sessions taking place right now. We really want you to be here. Um, and one of the things that Climate Resolve has done in uh, reducing GHG is helping to oversee a program here in Los Angeles County where we're mitigating uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there's a large uh, concern that is here. And, and what they have done has been to uh, have a commitment to getting to uh, net zero emissions for this project. And part of their uh, mitigation package um, concerns local mitigation. So not just cook stoves in Africa, not just capturing methane from a variety of sources, not just forestry, but actually uh, going out and reducing GHG in the local, local ways here. I'm not at liberty to go into great detail related to the programs on this, but I just want to assure you that it's, uh, it's a really robust program, and uh, we see this as a great area of opportunity to bring benefits directly to especially low-income, disadvantaged communities to, to be part of this uh, clean tech revolution. And I think of it in a way uh, related to... Um, in the stormwater world, there is a policy called low impact development. Some of you know it, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, a few people. Um, and this otherwise known as LID. You know, we're now in California, properties uh, by law uh, have to um, capture all the stormwater that falls on their property. And if they're unable to capture the stormwater, even during large rain events, they have to uh, pay into a mitigation fund to be able to capture that stormwater through other means. Uh, in this room yesterday, uh, some of us are talking about a VMT uh, scheme that could be developed potentially, creating a, ba a bank where um, we could potentially uh, try to limit the amount of VMT from a certain project, and if they couldn't do it at that project, uh, they would pay into a bank by other means that we could reduce VMT in certain areas. So the, this idea that, that is so well uh, captured by cap and trade as a uh, crediting uh, mechanism uh, could indeed happen in other areas as well. And we're here to explore what these other mitigation efforts could be. And so we have with us three wonderful speakers. Uh, the first being Craig Ebert, who is the president and CEO of the Climate Action Reserve. We are all here as his guests for his event. And I know Craig's going to talk about the Climate Forward program that uh, he's spearheading. And uh, second, we have uh, Henry Hilkin from the Bay Area AQMD. And we get together about once a year when we're on a panel together. So it's uh, nice to see you, Henry. And last but definitely not least is uh, Stephanie Rogers with the World Bank, uh, who's going to be providing some really exciting ideas that the World Bank has been 
uh, doing in developing countries and other parts of the world. So we're going to kick it off right now with Craig. Can you tell us about Climate Forward, please? Well, thanks, Jonathan. You know, as Jonathan was saying, the, the theme of this session is non-traditional ap approaches to carbon crediting. And at the Climate Action Reserve, when uh, you know we've looked around at uh, how much more needs to happen to address climate change, and you heard me all talk about it this morning, the fundamental objective that I think all of us are facing is how do we enhance climate ambition? Now, as an offset project registry here in the state of California, Offsets are a wonderful way to, to mitigate greenhouse gases, but it's certainly not the only tool. And here it's largely used in a compliance context. And again, you know, there's the voluntary options as well. But when we looked at it, uh, there's a, a huge number of companies and organizations that are not taking the level of action to mitigate greenhouse gases that they should be. And so we've devised a program that we're calling Climate Forward that has a very simple proposition attached to it. For any company or organization that's investing in a new project, and we don't care what that project is, whatever it is, if it's generating additional greenhouse gases, own those greenhouse gases and mitigate them. It's perhaps a fallback on the traditional uh, pollu uh, polluter pays principle, but what we can't have is uh, all these new investments coming to market, and they happen every day of our lives, and, uh, uh, you know, they're just adding to the burden that the rest of us, uh, you know, are, are facing here in California and under the, the statewide caps or in other jurisdictions, maybe there's no cap at all. And so maybe they're getting off scot-free with taking no action at all. Well, the planet can't afford that anymore. We simply don't have the luxury. So Climate Forward is designed largely as a voluntary program. It doesn't have to be exclusively so, but it's targeted at everyone who's not a compliance company and says, own your greenhouse gases now and mitigate them now. So if you think about any new investment creating a future stream of greenhouse gas emissions, under Climate Forward, we're telling them, start mitigating them now. And, and we're open to any and all creative and innovative methodologies that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we've seen things already under the program. It's, you know, we're not even six months uh, officially launched yet. But we've seen things like... Uh, uh, solar PV panels on low-income homes in South LA, uh, innovative forestry projects in Northern California, and energy-efficient cook stoves in Zambia. Uh, purpose of our program is to the extent that a project needs to reach beyond its boundaries and mitigate, they can bring a methodology to us where our goal is to assure that that methodology uh, will have a high level of environmental integrity and that any project then that's done under that methodology uh, it, you know, will achieve those environmental objectives. We're structured this. There's no geographic boundaries on the program. And that, you know, as far as we're concerned, this is, can be an international program. We've had some discussions with international applications with a uh, LED switch out program in India that uh, one uh, corporate client may want to use. You know, we're agnostic on where the projects come from. A ton is a ton is a ton when it comes to climate change. And we'll leave it to the politicians to draw those needless boundaries, which they're very good at doing. But Climate Forward is designed to essentially offer ex ante accreditation of investment actions now. And keep in mind, because this is largely voluntary, companies are spending their hard earned cash to make this happen, and they should. It's a cost of doing business, and, and we need to uh, reflect that across the board that for any company, any organization that's uh, making that new investment, uh, they should view that as a cost of doing business and mitigate the climate impacts. Craig, could you define ex ante, please? Sure. Uh, in the offset world, uh, ex, it's everything's ex post, after the facts. Ex ante is uh, essentially crediting before the fact, and, and, and let me clarify that a little bit more with respect to the program. Um, we're giving credit for a future stream of mission reductions, say for uh, energy efficient cook stoves in Zambia. Let's say they have a seven year crediting period. We are gonna recognize the seven years forward nature of, of the credits that come from that. We will do that not because somebody says, oh, I'm going to do it, or oh, I think it's a good idea, maybe I'll get around to it. It's after the company has made the investment, they've spent their hard-earned cash, they've got the project up and running according to their expectations, 
Uh, and then we send out what, what we call a third-party confirmation body, body totally uh, independent from what we do, and they confirm that the project follows the approved methodology and is generating the credits as expected. So ex ante is largely before the fact, but it is still after the investment has been made. Thanks, Craig. I know we'll be hearing more from you, but I want to turn to Henry. And you just heard about the Climate Forward uh, proposal, how they are receiving methodologies on a regular basis. Um, coming from the perspective of as a regulator in, in, in the Bay Area, uh, AQMD, uh, talk about how this program could be helpful um, in, in San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, good. Um, happy to. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Craig and CIR, for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, so the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, we are the regulatory, the air pollution regulators for the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, we've been around for about 60 years, a little more. Um, and we established a climate program about 12 to 15 years ago. Um, and um, essentially, we're using all the different tools in our toolbox to address climate. We, we have regulations. We uh, give out incentives, um, policy work with cities and counties. Um, some, we're not kind of getting into market mechanisms yet in climate, but for many years we have dealt with um, trading air pollution credits. So we're very familiar with using markets for addressing air pollution, and so it's not much of a, a leap for us to, to think about that in the climate realm. Um, so I guess, and I've had an opportunity to talk with Craig about Climate Forward um, prior to this conference, and I think it presents for us, there are a couple exciting opportunities that we're really interested in, and there are a couple challenges I think we're going to have to need to work through. Um, I think we're all aware, and we've heard this morning, to really tackle long-term climate stabilization, it's an all-in strategy. I mean, really have to look at every single tool that we have available to us. And so I think market mechanisms um, are, are an essential part of that. And um, one, one area that I see this fitting in with our programs really well, something at the Air District, one of the things we do is provide guidance to cities and counties on how they implement the California Environmental Quality Act. How many non-Californians in the audience today? Oh, fair number. Okay. CEQA is the California analog to the National Environmental Policy Act. It requires cities and counties or other public agencies to evaluate environmental impacts of development projects before they're um, approved. It's, it's long. It's long. It's it's um, it's longstanding practice in California. And so we have provided guidance to cities and counties. So, let's, so how do you do these analyses? How I'm a city of Santa Clara or San Jose or Milpitas. How am I supposed to sort of evaluate climate impacts and mitigate climate impacts in development? So we, that's the kind of technical work that we support, that we work with our cities and counties on. And several years, about 10 years ago, we provided recommended thresholds of significance. One of the, the key steps in CEQA is defining that benchmark. What is the, the determining factor when there will be a significant impact or not? And so we provided some suggestions on how local governments can set those thresholds for, of significance for environmental review documents. And without getting too down in the weeds, we basically tried to tie it back to the statewide scoping plan. The California Air Resources Board has created, has a, created a plan and updated it regularly laying out a pathway for California to meet climate stabilization. And so we, we based our thresholds on that scoping plan. If you're not doing everything you can to comply with the state's wide-ranging climate programs, that would be a significant impact, and you have to do more to minimize your GHG impacts from your development project. So a few years ago, the state, uh, the original AB 32 was aimed at achieving climate targets for 2020. Now, of course, we have 2030 and even 2050 targets, which are much more aggressive. And so we're currently tuning up our CEQA guidelines to try and get to those longer-term targets. Well, it's going to be a lot more difficult, as I think we're all aware, that, that low, those long-term stabilization goals are going to be very challenging. So we're grappling with that now. Um, our current thresholds are sort of a combination of both quantitative and qualitative metrics. And we're still tying it back to those statewide programs. But the state of California has such sweeping, wide-ranging climate programs, there's not much left on the table. So if we're expecting, if we're recommending that um, those determinations of significance be based on are you doing everything 
that the state expects of you, that becomes a really tough bar. Um, that's a tough test to make. And so then how do you make up that difference? And I think that's where offsets and credits can really help um, fill in that gap. Um, so I think that's why we're really interested in that. I'm also, we're also very interested, just as Craig said, if it stimulates the market, if it stimulates investments in new innovative approaches or technologies, that's really interesting. Um, a couple things that we're still thinking about and working through. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been doing pollution trading for many years. It's in the Federal Clean Air Act. It's, it's a wide, it's widely accepted practice, but they're very um, strict procedures when you do pollution trading. Those emission reductions, we, we, you always want emission reductions at the facility whenever possible, but when trading does occur, those credits have to be real, surplus, permanent, quantifiable, and enforceable. And that's just, that's in our DNA. We are air pollution regulators. We cannot, that, that's just vitally important to us. They have to be real, surplus, and so forth. And so that's, we want to be flexible. We want to stimulate innovative um, technologies and approaches. But, but that's, that's really a line in the sand for us. We have, there has to be rigor um, and certainty with any sort of credits or offset programs. Um, and I get, the other issue that we've, we've, Craig and I have chatted about and that we're going to keep talking about is um, local, how, where, where do those reductions occur? I agree, for a global pollutant like greenhouse gases, a ton is a ton is a ton. However, um, I'm an air pollution guy. And we, we have air pollution and health challenges locally in the Bay Area. And that, that's my primary mission. And um, we, recent legislation has really um, forced us very much to look much more locally than we have in the past. We traditionally have looked at regional air pollution and achieving air pollution standards throughout the Bay Area. Um, a couple years ago, when the state reauthorized, the state of California, the legislature reauthorized the cap and trade program. AB 398 extended the cap and trade program out to 2030. It's a really critical part of our statewide climate program. As part of that, um, part of that legislation, part of the deal, was that it took away some of the authority from local air districts like mine to regulate CO2 from the cap sources. So carbon dioxide from the sources that are subject to the statewide cap and trade program, we no longer have the authority to regulate those. We can regulate methane, other GHGs, and we can even regulate CO2 from non-capped sources. But, but there is a pretty uh, major limitation on our authority there. A companion bill to 398 was AB 617. And that was a lot of the environmental advocates and EJ, environmental justice advocates, are very leery about trading, okay? And they wanted protections for local pollution and local health. And so AB 617 sets up a process where air districts like mine work with communities to, well, to identify, to work with the state to identify those communities in our region that are most impacted by air pollution and then work with those community groups to develop local air quality plans to, to reduce local exposure and improve health. And you heard this morning, I think uh, Jared mentioned um, the freight sector and how much of our, the, the nation's goods come through the Port of LA, Long Beach, and Oakland. Well, our first community that we're planning for under AB 617 is West Oakland. They are right next to the Port of Oakland. They have the highest exposure to diesel PM in the Bay Area. Um, health impact, the, all the health indicators are terrible. And um, I can't emphasize enough how much this bill has really changed the way we do our business. We are all local all the time. And we are working with these community groups at a block by block level to develop strategies to um, get truck related businesses out of the community, to get additional regulation, to reduce idling, all the sorts of things we can do to reduce exposure to diesel PM in these communities. So while I, we are very excited about opportunities for trading and credits, we are at the same time very focused on local air pollution. And so it's going to be really important, and our communities will demand um, that those benefits accrue locally, that pollution co-benefits of any climate investments happen locally, that economic benefits from those investments 
accrue to the local community. So um, I agree that a ton is a ton, but at the same time, we have this imperative to look locally. So that's that's something we're going to keep debating with 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 Craig as we move forward with this. Thanks, thanks, cool Henry. idea. Thanks, Henry. Uh, before we move on to to Stephanie, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, both Henry and, and Craig. Give us maybe a couple examples. Give us a hypothetical, what a climate forward client would be, and then give us an example of how that project or that development that's taking place could benefit by adding a buffer of additional GHG reductions and what that would look like. Do you, do you have some ideas, Craig, that you could share with us? I'm not sure what you mean by an additional buffer, but I'll, I'll give you an example, and it's, it's not totally hypothetical. Uh, there is a, uh, matter of fact, it's not hypothetical. In northern L.A. County, there's a planned community uh, uh, being built called uh, Newhall Ranch, and they've committed to uh, net carbon zero development in that uh, 21,000 home community. Now, they're doing a lot on site to lower the carbon footprint of that entire plant community. Uh, PV panels on every roof, uh, electric chargers in every garage, sustainable transportation network. But there are a number of things they need to do beyond the fence line of that planned community, and that's where Climate Forward comes in. They're looking at a, a suite of strategies that includes things like uh, uh, there's a, uh, as I mentioned, uh, that was an innovative uh, forestry project I mentioned in Northern California, the solar PV panels on lower income homes in South LA. They're uh, insulating pool covers on uh, public pools in, in, in South LA. Again, this is part of the responding to the EJ concerns. Uh, they're doing a, a dairy digester project, and they're also doing the, uh, uh, the energy efficient cook stoves in Zambia. Now, that's um, obviously a, a, a somewhat eclectic mix of strategies. But Henry, part, part of the answer, and I'm, I'm glad you raised that about the need to go local. From a climate perspective, yeah, a ton is a ton is a ton, but you know, we're not uh, blind to a lot of the, the uh, political drivers that often affect discussions on any project. And one of the things that can happen with Climate Forward is that there's often, um, it provides the opportunity to uh, bring those local innovative uh, mitigation strategies home. If you want to do them locally, fine, you can do them under Climate Forward. Now, inevitably, there's always that trade-off between how cost-effective it is, and that's why there's often a blended strategy, but uh, Climate Forward can definitely provide a nice avenue for a lot of those local investments, and here in California, it's a way for the environmental justice community to address some of those local reductions. Thank you. Henry, do you have anything I, to New add? That's to that? the New Orleans Ranch was the example I would have spoken to. I think that's a great example. Um, that's a specific example. I think in general there would be opportunities um, in existing buildings. I think there would be, you know, there are a lot of, uh, California has very strict standards for new buildings. I think there would be potential for um, dealing with the existing building stock to apply these types of credits to um, energy efficiency and improvements at existing buildings. And I think vehicle um, transportation behavior, VMT, I would love to talk to you more about your VMT bank that you talked about yesterday. We've had a lot of panels today about electric vehicles. Vehicle technology is going to be really, really critical. But we haven't talked as much about behavior. VMT continues to increase every year, even in California. So we have got to reduce the amount that we drive, even electric vehicles. There are a lot of embedded power in EVs. So getting to... Um, uh, reduced vehicle use is, is another possible opportunity for local investments. Yeah, through land use. All right. Now, moving on to Stephanie. She's going to broaden our minds by talking about, uh, from the World Bank's perspective, uh, how we can move beyond traditional carbon crediting internationally. It's all yours, Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to Climate Action Reserve and to you, Jonathan, for having me here today. So uh, zooming out indeed to the global level, but also looking at a lot of programs that, of course, do have local impact in our client countries. I have a few slides, but I think given the orientation of the room, I'm going to um, skip putting up most of them and maybe just use a few diagrams as, as they come up. So I, I will put up my um, placeholder slide here. Should we switch? That's OK. I, I have the remote. <clears throat> OK. Again, I'm Stephanie Rogers. I'm a financial specialist with the World Bank Group. Uh, the World Bank is the largest development bank. And I am in the climate change group. And within that, I'm in a team called the Carbon Markets and Innovation Team. 
And in light of the changing carbon markets under the Paris Agreement, we're working to support the World Bank's client countries, the developing countries of the world, on their plans for uh, climate actions that they've submitted under the Paris Agreement. So climate action is very much a, a bottom-up matter internationally right now. And um, we are trying to use carbon markets to make those countries' plans come into uh, fruition at lower costs and, and hopefully at a faster um, time frame. The pledges that countries have made internationally only uh, cover about one third of the emission reductions needed to be on a least cost pathway to two degrees or uh, under two degrees Celsius. So achieving these goals, even this one third that cover these emission reductions that we need, uh, requires a massive amount of finance and, and we need to use public finance in a really smart way to um, leverage the private sector finance that is available. Um, Carbon pricing and, and international carbon markets, linking carbon markets and, and fostering stronger domestic carbon markets, we believe creates an, an opportunity to accelerate climate action. So uh, in, while the, the international climate negotiations are still ongoing, we think that there's an opportunity to pilot new crediting approaches, new approaches to international cooperation to demonstrate how markets can play a really crucial role. Uh, Article 6 is the part of the Paris Agreement that is, is covering international carbon markets and one of... advancing. Oh yeah, that's okay. I'm just referring oh. to this. Okay. One of the um, mechanisms that will still be defined is, is Article 6.2 and this provision allows for bilateral or multilateral cooperation among countries uh, using market-based mechanisms. So the term that we're using for now because it came out of the international negotiations is mitigation outcomes instead of carbon credits. Um, but perhaps that will be defined as, as things become clearer. We're hoping for a clarity at uh, the Conference of Parties in Santiago, Chile in December. So we know that uh, the countries around the world are working hard to come to an agreement on what the rules should be for international carbon markets. My work program, it, we're calling the Climate Warehouse is providing support to our member countries to operationalize markets under this Article 6. So we have three parts of our, our work program in this piloting space. One is on asset development, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The second is an infrastructure piece we're calling a warehouse. And the third is a transaction products to help uh, get private sector companies interested in making the investments that they need to make soon um, in order to realize these climate outcomes. So I'll put up one diagram. So I, in terms of talking about piloting of asset development, the World Bank has commitments of $40 billion per year to developing countries in terms of its lending program. And out of that $40 billion, there's about $11 billion of mitigation and adaptation co-benefits. $7 billion of mitigation co-benefits, and we think that there's potential for $500 to $700 million <laughs> per year of essentially carbon credits or mitigation outcomes. But what it would take to create those mitigation outcomes is a movement from ex-ante greenhouse gas assessment, which the World Bank and other multilateral development banks apply to their programs today, to ex-post verification of those outcomes. So of course there are existing carbon standards, countries are developing their own standards, um, but we think through applying monitoring, reporting, and verification and, and robust methodologies, mitigation outcomes can be created that can either be used by countries against their own climate targets or for international trading. And, and the statistic we refer to, or the analysis on the benefits of trading is that um, the analysis showed in 2016 in our state and, trends, state and Trends of Carbon Pricing that this NDC implementation, the, the nationally determined contributions, the cost of NDC implementation will be driven down 30% by 2030 and 50% by 2050 if there's strong international cooperation. So once these mitigation outcomes are created and verified, a lot of countries have expressed that they're not sure uh, yet how they want to use them or whether they want to allow for international transfer. And this is where this re uh, infrastructure piece consisting of registries and a meta registry comes into play. So I'll, I'll speak more about that in a moment. 
Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. We don't need all these words on the screen for sure. Our pilot programs are occurring at the country level, institutional level, regional, and, and covering whole sectors in certain countries. So on the country level, we're working with India and Bangladesh to pilot large-scale programs relating to renewable energy and uh, improved livestock management practices. On the institutional level, we're piloting a program with uh, the Kenya Electricity Generating Company, KenGen, which has a portfolio of existing CDM projects, clean development mechanism, but wants to create more mitigation outcomes from its portfolio, applying a new MRV framework. On the regional lev level, there is a West African power pool, uh, and we're looking at how to support the members of that power pool to, again, generate mitigation outcomes. And finally, we've announced a collaboration with the government of Chile, which will be the host of this year's Conference of the Parties, and they are developing a sectoral-wide MRV system and want to generate their own mitigation outcomes out of their energy programs, which are focused on renewable energy, decarbonization, decommissioning of coal plants, e-mobility, and energy efficiency. Um, moving on, I think I'll skip some of these slides on our warehouse, but really the idea here is to move from ex anti asset development to ex post verification and sovereign approval to a place to bank these mitigation outcomes and eventually to transactions. In terms of the infrastructure piece, we're looking at the role of the warehouse is to bring together information across national borders and across programs so that you can have a view into the mitigation outcomes that exist in the world, the standards under which they were generated. Uh, there is an independent assessment protocol that we've developed in, within the World Bank called the Mitigation Action Assessment Protocol, but that is now being considered by the Association of Independent Entities to compare different types of mitigation outcomes. And um, so we're thinking of this as, as akin to Amazon.com, but basically an interface where you could look at the results that are being generated around the world and, and have some sense of transparency and comparability, as well as tracking and reporting uh, functionalities for countries to avoid uh, problems of double counting and double claiming that, that we're trying to address or the countries are trying to address under the Paris Agreement. And finally, on the transaction side, we're working with a, a group of private sector companies through AIDA. Um, we have an advisory group consisting of countries and these private sector entities, and, and the companies have weighed in that some of the key risks they're facing are market risks and regulatory risks. So on the market side, some country companies will be purchasers for certain compliance programs. So we are looking at the development of options contracts that would give them the right but not the obligation to purchase carbon credits. And on the regulatory side, we're looking at a, a sovereign risk guarantee. So there's part of the World Bank group that provides uh, political risk guarantees for private sector companies. And here in this regulatory space where host countries need to authorize the transfer of credits. Some companies have expressed that it would be useful to have that type of guarantee that would pay out if the, comp if the country didn't take that action. So I know that there's a lot of ideas here. The World Bank has other carbon crediting pilots looking at new types of crediting, policy crediting, sectoral crediting, economy-wide. So the Carbon Initiative for Development focuses on energy access in, in Africa. Um, there are current CDM projects, but they're looking at a standardized crediting framework to transition those projects after CDM phases out. The Transformative Carbon Asset Facility, likewise, is looking at economy-wide sectoral and policy crediting, and the Carbon Partnership Facility is also looking at these innovative credi crediting approaches that are much broader than an individual project. For more information, <laughs> um, that's just my name, my, my co-team Lee's name, and my colleague Rachel Mock, who's sitting in the back, um, and who has brochures if anyone is interested, will be presenting tomorrow on the blockchain aspects of this work program. Thank you Thanks. so much. So quick question, what are some of the failures that you've discovered with uh, ex-ante crediting, and why the transition? Mm. I, I actually think that ex ante uh, crediting has been a very successful collaboration among the, the multilateral development banks that has allowed us to um, project the, the climate benefits of our projects. Um, but 
Our pilot program involves the ex post verification in because countries will have to account for their results toward their targets. And so um, the ex ante projection wouldn't be necessarily enough to do that. Okay. And you, you mentioned the phrase policy crediting. Could you elaborate on that, please? Uh, policy crediting. Well, this is an area of, uh, you know, more specific um, work is being done on the concepts. But the idea, yeah, yeah it's a conceptual idea at this point. Uh, I refer you to the Transformative Carbon Asset Facility, which is working on the concept. But basically the idea is that out of a certain um, large-scale policies, for example, like an energy efficiency intervention, you can use a baseline for that sector or for even the country, and, and then um, using you know, new methodologies in MRV um, quantify the impact of that policy change. That would go towards their Paris commitments. Right. Very interesting. Or, or even um, be used for international trading. So th the TCAF facility is actually already capitalized with $210 million from international donors, and they will be purchasing some of the outcomes from those types of programs. That's great. Well, but are these outcomes nominated in tons? Yes. Yeah, for TCAF, it's all tons of CO2. -E. Well, I thought that was a beautiful segue, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to go into uh, uh, question. I should say, but some of our pilots eventually may look at other metrics. Um, but, but for those carbon funds, they are looking at tons. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, concept. Uh, are there some questions in, in the audience for, uh, from the presentations, or else I'll just dive in with some of my own questions? Yes, sir, right there. So private companies implement a lot of the World Bank's programs, but the, the relationship that the World Bank has is with the member countries. So the World Bank's lending programs lend to the governments, which then finance large-scale programs. Um, in terms of our work program, we, as I mentioned, have this advisory group of private sector companies. Right now we have 13 companies that are lending it, their advice to this program with the idea that some of them are interested in either being buyers and sell or sellers in a future market. Um, and then finally, in some of our historical uh, carbon funds in the Kyoto Protocol era, there actually were certain private uh, sector companies that were purchasers of carbon credits through, through the World Bank's carbon funds. So currently, I think it's more of on an advisory basis and, and sharing lessons learned, as you mentioned. Um, but on the large scale program side, you know, private sector companies are implementing entities of the government financing um, that implement very large, you know, infrastructure projects, energy, transport, agriculture. The World Bank covers virtually all sectors. If I could add to that, I, I think it's an interesting question because, you know, Stephanie uh, mentioned the World Bank has historically done a fabulous job of working with on a government to government level for a lot of this crediting, and that's part of the challenge. For example, if you're going to do the proper accounting as to whether the Paris Agreement is, is being met. From a corporate standpoint, you know, one of the fundamental questions is even to what extent do you want to tie into that international accounting framework? Uh, and, 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 and obviously it's up to each country to decide how to assess that, but, you know, we got multinational companies with presence in many, you know, across many uh, national geographic borders, and it doesn't obviously uh, align necessarily nicely with uh, national level accounting, and so that may or may not be relevant, and it's partly related to the whole financing question. I mean, as Stephanie said, the World Bank is the largest development bank, and I think you said three-quarters of a trillion a year? Forty billion. Yeah. Okay, yeah. forty forty billion. Well, the estimates that that that, uh, that have been out there for you know global commitments to achieve the, the Paris Agreement is ninety trillion dollars by twenty thirty. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not don't mean to diminish the importance of of any of the development banks, or even the national uh, lending that uh, that needs to happen to uh, you know uh, catalyze a lot of action here. But the reality of it is the vast majority of mitigation funding is going to come from the private sector. And harnessing that energy and that uh, uh, financing is, is critically important. Uh, and uh, I wish I had a nice flippant answer to make that happen, but that is one of our challenges. 
Well, I, so Craig, I thought you were going to pitch Salesforce to mm -hmm. uh, become part of uh, Climate Forward and become a net zero corporation and that you could supply the services for them. So. Max and I have been chatting. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's another tool in his strategic arsenal. And then, Henry, I thought you would help Salesforce finish that damn park so they could capture some of the pollutants in San Francisco. It's a beautiful so. park. We, uh, <laughs> we had nice picnic lunches out there for a few weeks, but then there were some, they shut it down again. Not Salesforce, the city. There were other issues, but yeah. <laughs> you deny all responsibility to the park. Is this? All right, thank you. All right, you can see we're a friendly group up here. You have to have questions. Come on, please. Developers, I understand why they might have a vested interest for anyone else who might be on it. Is it like typically it's going to be ex ante kind of offsets that eventually? Can I, I apologize. I didn't. You said ex ante metrics? Sorry, so it sounds like if it's just ex ante, then they eventually become payable offsets, but would there be other Well, first and foremost, Climate Forward is geared towards the company making the investment in the project. They may or may not be traded. Um, you know, uh, uh, Stephanie's talking about ITMOs and, and need to do international transferred mitigation outcomes. We've got the classy title FMUs or forecasted mitigation units. Uh, these are not offsets, you know, but you're, you're right. Uh, any project down the road potentially could, uh, you know, you're no longer dealing after, say, 10 years of operation with a, uh, an ex-ante assessment. We have structured the program to recognize that the initial ex ante accreditation that will occur will be very conservative, and that's always in terms of, of tons of CO2E. Um, we're, we've provided incentives in the program on a couple of different levels. Uh, one, to encourage the, the project proponent to continue to monitor and come back subsequently at some point in the future and say, you gave us a thousand you know, FMUs you know, back in 2019, I can prove to you that I've actually generated 2,000. And, and so we do allow for that ex ante assessment. And ultimately, uh, you know, if it's an ex ante assessment, uh, you know, there, there starts to be uh, uh, fundamentally that, that you're uh, following the principles that are followed in the offset program. Potentially, those could become offsets. Um, you know, so we're open to, to that consideration for the, that additional uh, recognition of credits. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're conservative in recognition, in, in recognizing the quantity of credits, um, just to make sure that we're getting the environmental benefits we all need. Stephanie, did you want to address her question? Yes, the question was on the composition of the advisory group. So AIDA has uh, convened and coordinated the members in this advisory group, which <laughs> signed a memorandum of understanding with the World Bank, basically to collaborate and share, sharing information um, and potentially uh, collaborating on initiatives in the future. So uh, the, we are working on our website <laughs> for this whole initiative, but I think we'll be making public the, the members of this advisory group. There are 13 companies off the top of my head. There are companies ranging at, at, you know, from Shell and Equinor um, to project developers. There's a forest um, or a, a landscapes project developer, Permian Global. Um, and and then we have financial institutions and, and a foundation, the Climate Works Foundation. So the membership we've aimed to be diverse in terms of covering you know different interests to inform this um, work program. There's also some companies from Japan and Korea that are subject to certain compliance obligations or are involved in, for example, in Japan in the J JCM uh, uh, market. So. We're trying to be diverse in, in that uh, a lot of World Bank uh, countries are represented, and we're also including project implementing entities in Bangladesh and India that are working on our pilot programs, as well as the governments of Chile, Spain, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, the last three of which are donors to the initiative. Thank you. Next question. Pop quiz. Pop quiz. How many of you are going to Santiago? One, two, three, four. There's a, okay, how, maybe, how many might go who are in the room? Okay, see Craig Egebert, he has, no, I'm, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, other questions? We, sir, you again. Um, I'm a little confused. 
it's not. It's not working, Jillian. What? Hello. Oh, there it is. Um, Don't swallow it. Is there any relationship between the CDM and the program that the World Bank? And, and, and right. the reason I'm saying that is that if, if, the, uh, if the CDM is already producing marketable offsets, then how is this going to be different? So some of our pilot projects are using CDM methodologies, or indeed for some of the carbon funds like CDEV are issuing credits under CDM. But uh, as far as we know, we're you know outsiders to the negotiations, but CDM will transition at some point to perhaps the sustainable development mechanism as yet to be defined. Um, so our program is not only reliant on CDM as a standard. Um, for example, the livestock engagement in Bangladesh is using a gold standard methodology. Some countries like Chile are developing their own methodologies, I think that are, you know, perhaps based on CDM methodologies, et cetera. But our program isn't promoting one, you know, carbon standard. Um, we may also include renewable energy certificates or, or other metrics, um, depending on what the countries uh, have reflected in their national targets, because there are some um, countries that might want to trade renewable energy outcomes rather than, you know, tons of CO2 equivalent. So does that answer your question? But the CDM space, we're watching the space because we also aren't so in charge of perpetuating it. <laughs> The uh, mitigation outcomes um, will vary in value, though, presumably. Uh, it depends. I mean, it, yeah, I can't really speak to price, but it depends on the buyer and seller to determine the value, if, if we're talking about price. What we can talk about, and Rachel is our worldwide expert probably in this mitigation action assessment protocol, is a tool to um, compare different aspects of the project. So even looking at things like sustainable development benefits, mm -hmm. uh, this map tool gives a score to different aspects of programs so that you could compare you know, different types of mitigation outcomes. So our concept for the warehouse includes that map assessment um, yeah, to, to lend comparability and transparency across programs and jurisdictions. Thanks. So here in California, uh, we have CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, and that CEQA was sort of the underpinning by which there was a lawsuit brought against the effort that you mentioned earlier, Newhall Ranch, to uh, address their greenhouse gas emissions associated with the project. And, and so uh, the, the company at Newhall Ranch has done an amazing thing of getting to net zero uh, carbon. That's their ambition. Um, and yet, can CEQA then be a tool for moving projects to uh, net zero? And is there, are there legislative tweaks to CEQA? Are there um, regulatory actions to CEQA that could help us in the climate fight? Henry? Wow, <laughs> man. Well, no, CEQA is definitely a tool. I mean, I've never thought it's the greatest tool for addressing this, CEQA comes very late in the development process. When a process, project gets to the CEQA step, um, it has a lot of momentum, it has a lot of investment. Um, you can still tweak things at the margin, but I, don't, I think fundamentally we, um, we very much have favored working with cities and counties on their, their general plans, looking at their long-range growth plans. Um, land use patterns to support alternative transportation modes, uh, things like that. I think that, that's where there's going to be a bigger, where really turn the knob um, on land use and transportation planning and how it, um, what greenhouse gas emissions result. Um, but CEQA is absolutely an important tool. Um, anytime you talk about amendments to CEQA, that is a third rail in Sacramento. Let me tell you, there have been efforts from both the left and the right to amend CEQA over the years. They almost always crash and burn. Um, so as an intellectual exercise, we can speculate about what sort of revisions could occur. I think, um, I don't know. For me, it's 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 not. CEQA doesn't require mitigation. Re requires disclosure. Um, a, 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 local, a, a public agency has to evaluate impacts, 
disclose them to the public and to the decision makers, but ultimately projects can occur even if they have significant impacts. So it's, um, it's a tool. It's, it's, uh, it, it's one of the tools. It's, it's imperfect. Projects like Newell Ranch, though, that was, um, that was a tremendous outcome. So, uh, so, so your advice would be to, to people in this room, if they're Californians, really focus in on the general plans. Yeah, to do, yes, to, to, to plan your communities in such a way that it incentivizes or requires development to achieve those same outcomes that the New Wall Ranch ended up. Craig, uh, do, you have some, do you have some ideas? Well, I, I'm not a CEQA expert, but I will say this. I, I, I know enough about it to know that the consideration of, of greenhouse gases has been relatively late in the game. And, and as Henry noted, it, it's been largely a, a, a local planning exercise. And when we're talking about climate issues, you know, that's not the, the, uh, what we're really concerned about when it comes to climate change. I, you know, I think whether it's under CEQA or some other mechanism, Everybody needs to accept responsibility for the greenhouse gases, and it just needs to become part and parcel of everyday discussion and not a question of whether or not it's my responsibility. It is everyone's responsibility. If you're generating the emissions, own it. Yeah. So, S Stephanie, uh, you're here in California. Uh, California's had a lot of legislative action on climate change. Uh, we're really proud of our SB 100. It's going to be at... Uh, zero carbon electricity by the year 2045. Former governor Jerry Brown said with an executive order that he's gonna move the rest of the economy in California to net zero by 2045. That's not in legislation, but it's, it's there. So is there a theory that if California's economy is doing well, that there's good employment, that there's a vibrant economy, and we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions at the same time, that that becomes more influential, probably, than trying to get federal action on climate change. What's your view? In my world came bank capacity. I have no view on <laughs> <laughs> national politics. As an American, <laughs> it's very fun to be at a conference focused on North America, and, and in particular, my family lives in California, so it's, it's really exciting for me to see these actions taking place, um, because living in Washington, we uh, can get a bit bogged down. Um, so all I'll say is that that's very exciting, and uh, I hope that California leads the way. Thanks. Uh, are there people here who want to open up an account at the World Bank? <laughs> <laughs> I would, for one. I'd, I'd like to. Okay, <laughs> very good. Um, other questions? I, I saw a few more hands. Last question, and, and then class dismissed. Oh, come on. Yes, there please. Go. Let's go back to the forest, shall we? Thank you. Um, this is a question for Stephanie. Um, I feel like the World Bank has a great many programs around carbon markets and always quite know what each of them is doing. Um, I'd love just to hear, you know, is this all like one team? Is it multiple teams? Do you guys actually feel like you know what each other is? We do have a lot of initi initiatives. We have a pretty large climate change group with, I think, about 200 staff, but that's broader than carbon markets. I think we have about 100 staff working on carbon markets, and there are two teams, one of which manages the big carbon funds that I mentioned, and our team which focuses on new uh, market instruments and carbon pricing and innovation. So, um, yeah, there's a lot going on at the World Bank, lots of piloting. I think we view our role as both supporting our member countries to achieve their, their goal of reducing poverty and increasing shared prosperity. We think climate is inextricably linked with development. Um, but the second uh, role that I think we're very keen on within our team is, is piloting and demonstration effect. So, Stephanie, is your climate team hiring at the World Bank? I am sure we are. <laughs> I'm not, well, I know well. that there are positions, uh, yeah. But All right. Just. We have a new president at the World Bank, so we're looking to um, see what will change. But I understand that he, the newspapers picked up on that he mentioned climate change twice in his opening remarks to staff. And, and assured that we would keep our ambitious corporate commitments uh, to our climate targets, so, which were recognized at the last COP. That sounds like breaking news to me. Thank you very much. Oh, thank Let's thank our panelists, please, for great presentations.
Thanks for coming.